Hey everybody, welcome back on this beautiful Monday night. Um, sitting in a different chair than I have been the last few times, and so my background might be a little bit different, but nothing wrong with mixing it up a little bit. Um, but all the same, we're not here for the background, we're here to study God's Word, so didn't think it would hurt to change spots. Anyway, hope you all had a good uh, Monday, uh, another quarantine, social distancing Monday. I hope you guys made the best of it, and uh, you know, my family and I were able to run out and grab some curbside dinner at one of our local restaurants tonight, uh, so that was nice to get out and just go for a quick little drive. My wife and my little girl. So family time is always good, no matter what the circumstances. So, hello, Shannon. Glad you're here tonight. I like, I like the ways there. So, so yeah, just giving people another minute or two to get logged on here, and uh, we'll dive into God's Word. Shannon, I hope your day was excellent under the circumstances. Drinking myself a Dr. Pepper here for all you guys who love Dr. Pepper and be jealous. So, I would love to come to San Antonio again sometime, Shannon. Didn't realize you guys were living in that part of Texas. Hey, Dina, glad you made it in. San Antonio is a beautiful place. Been there a couple different times. So, anyway, I'm glad it sounds like life is good. Your, your guys' comments are coming in a very positive tone, uh, which is cool. I'm glad to see that. That's encouraging. Hi, Andrea. Glad you made it in with us as well. So, welcome back. Well, Dina, I'm glad you're enjoying the Diet Dr. Pepper there. That's always good. I'm glad we're a Dr. Pepper family here on Facebook Live. But, anyway, seems like uh, we've got ourselves a little group logged on here, and I'm sure uh, some more people will jump in here in the next couple minutes. But uh, if you haven't already turned there, uh, open up to Psalm 119 in your Bibles. That's where we're going to be today. i uh, got a couple, three questions to throw at you during our study today. Stuff to think about in this text. I hope we don't have any problems with the polls, because uh, I know one or two of you weren't able to see the polls that I published last night. I hope that does not happen tonight. Uh, still working out the kinks and all this, but before we get started, let's get started with the prayer, and then we'll dive into God's Word. Let's pray. Father in Heaven, thank you for this time that, uh, that you've given to us this evening. Um, to study your word, thank you for those that are present here uh, tonight. Um, continue to be with our country and all our friends and family who are affected by the coronavirus issue. We, we again thank you for this avenue of technology that allows us to meet and study your word and to continue growing in our relationship with you. Thank you for those that are present here tonight and pray that our study might be fruitful and encouraging and glorifying to you, God. Thank you for Jesus, Father, and help us always to look to him for strength. Give us of our sins, and it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so Psalm 119. If you saw my Facebook post earlier, um, we're going to be studying verses 81 through 88. Uh, you even see that on the title of this uh, particular broadcast. But um, if you've been following our studies, uh, one of the themes that comes out in Psalm 119 is the fact that the psalmist, the things that he writes indicates that he's going through some kind of suffering which is a lot of the reason that prompts him to write the things that he does throughout this psalm about God's word and his relationship with God and his word. And 
that theme comes out once again here in verses 81 through 88, the suffering theme that we see through this psalm. Um, per my Facebook post earlier, if you saw it, um, what we see as far as suffering is concerned in this particular section that we're going to be looking at is that the psalmist, he craves some things from God. He, he, we see a lot of questions, or not a lot, but a few questions in this psalm about him wanting God to act in his situation and what he's going to do while he waits for God to act in this time of suffering that he's going through. So what we're going to see here um, for us in our study of what can be gleaned from this text are what I'm seeing three different principles as to what we crave from God in those times of suffering, in those times of difficulty in our lives, like the ones we are going through at this very time in our country um, and in whatever other form we might be struggling at this time. So the first principle we'll see from verses 81 through 83 is as far as what we crave is that our craving for God's promises is intensified when we suffer. From the verses 84 through 87, the principle we'll see is that our craving for God's judgment is intensified when we suffer. And finally, from verse 88, the third principle we'll see is that our craving for God's love is intensified when we suffer. And so what we'll learn from these things, the application, if you will, is that in times of suffering, it's imperative is the word I'm using. It's imperative that we turn to God, knowing that God can give us a new perspective on our suffering, because we can be reminded that the suffering in this life is not all there is. And, it, and as a result, it causes us to crave those better things that we find in God um, when we suffer. So with that in mind, um, we're just going to read through this psalm, if you'll follow along, or through these verses, I should say, um, if you'll follow along with me. So again, we're in Psalm 119, verses 81 through 88. So if you'll follow along with me, we'll read and then we'll discuss it, talk about it a little bit. So in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 81, we read, My soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your word. My eyes fail with longing for your word. While I say, when will you comfort me? Though I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. All your commandments are faithful. They have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. They almost destroyed me on earth. But as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. All right. <clears throat> so the first principle again that we're going to be looking at here as far as what we crave from God when we suffer is our craving for God's promises is intensified when we suffer. Now we notice that in the first line here of verse 81 he says my soul languishes for your salvation. That's in the New American Standard. That's the translation I'm using. But this brings me to the first question I want to throw at you. And the question is, what does it mean to languish? I'm publishing that now. And the options are what it means to languish to feel weak, option A, or the second option, be an extreme need of something. Now, the poll is published. Take your time looking at those answers. Um, if you have any problems, if you don't see the poll or have any other issue, just let me know via the comments. Hi, Michelle. Glad you're here tonight. But I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think about that question and um, 
We'll see where the results go. Again, the question is, what does it mean to languish? Option A, feel weak. Option B, be in extreme need of something. Take your time. I'll give it about 20 more seconds. Is everyone seeing the poll? Okay. I don't see anybody saying no, so that's good. All right. Ten more seconds and then we'll pause the poll. And pause. All right, so the question was, what does it mean to languish? Uh, the options were feel weak or to be in extreme need of something. Um, I only got one response and I think that was you, Andrea. Uh, you put feel weak. Um, so obviously 100% said that. Um, so, yeah, he says this, and it is this idea that he has reached a state where of spirit, uh, the psalmist has reached a state of spiritual exhaustion, we might say, or weakness, and this um, is the idea here. And so his suffering, the picture that seems to be being painted is that suffering is so intense is that he's tired, really putting it that simply. And so that's what brings him to this idea in the second line of verse 81 where he says, I wait for your word. Now, um, this idea of waiting is another prevalent concept throughout Psalm 119. So I decided, I just typed up this question while I was waiting on the last one, and I'm going to go ahead and throw this one at you. We're still here in verse 81. What do you think it means to wait for God's word? Option A, to hope in his word. Option B, to expect God's promises. And Andrea, I saw your comment there that your version says your soul faints with longing. And what I just described lends to that idea that he is fainting with longing, we might say. But here's your current question. What does it mean to wait for God's word? There in the second line of verse 81. I'll give you guys another couple minutes to think about that. Sorry, your phone won't display the poll, Shannon. Uh, still working out the kinks on this, but I appreciate your answer there. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Less than a minute, I should say.
All right, pause it there. Uh, the majority uh, said that it deals with the idea of hope and shine. That's what you said. And the answer on the poll that I received, it's the same idea to hope in his word. It is the idea of hope, um, this idea of waiting. Now, I like that picture personally because when you're waiting for something or waiting for someone, you're expecting it. That's the very definition of waiting. You're expecting something to come. Uh, just a silly example, uh, when mine and my wife's little girl wants something, sometimes we have to tell her, you have to wait. In her little mind, that means she knows it's coming and she's expecting it. The biblical idea of waiting is just the same, but it's even more, more than that. It is the idea of hope, as you put it, Shannon. It's the biblical idea of hope. It's not only that it might come, but that it will come. And that's when sometimes you'll hear the technical definition for it, confident expectation. And so putting these two lines of verse 81 together, it's the idea that he's reached a point of spiritual exhaustion, but this doesn't prevent him from putting his hope in God's word, but even more specifically in the promises of God's word. And one reason we can say that is because sometimes when the psalmist talks about God's word in this particular way, he has more in mind the promises that God has made through his word. And so he's reached this point of spiritual exhaustion because of his suffering. And so the only place he has left to turn for any kind of hope is God's word. That's verse 81, and that's what brings us into verse 82. Um, I'll just read it again. He says, my eyes fail with longing for your word while I say, when will you comfort me? Now, this brings me to question number two I want to throw at you. The question is, what do you hear the psalmist saying in verse 82? He's, he fails to see God working in his life, option A, or option B, he longs for relief from his troubles. Again, the question from verse 82 that I have for you is, what do you hear the psalmist saying in verse 82? He fails to see God working in his life. He longs for relief from his troubles. Again, I'll give you a couple minutes with that one. Give about 15 more seconds. All right, we'll just show the results there briefly. Again, the psalmist says, what do you hear the psalmist saying in verse 82? The question, I mean. He fails to see God working in his life. He longs for relief from his troubles. Uh, the response that you guys chose was he longs for relief um, from his troubles. Now, Andrea, I just spotted your comment. You say, oh, I'm waffling between the two answers. Um, and that's easy to do. And that's definitely okay with that um, because of the fact that both ideas seem to be involved here. So 
Similarly to verse 81, what the psalmist says here in verse 82 has the sense that he is failing to see God's promises uh, at work in his life. He's placed his hope in God's word. We saw that in verse 81, but at, in his present circumstance, he's failing to see those promises working in his life. And so he asks this question, God, when will you comfort me? Now, in this question, this is where we begin to see that the psalmist is wondering, God, when are you going to take care of this situation that I'm dealing with? How long will it be before you provide me with some relief? Now, he's not doing anything wrong in asking this question because it's an honest expression to God of how he's feeling right now. And that's I bring that up because... We need not be afraid to confess to God how we're really feeling about any given situation. God knows how we're feeling about any given situation. And so we need to express that to him, not in that we're angry with him, but in that we are relying on him to take care of our situation. And so that's where the psalmist is coming from with this question, God, when will you comfort me? When will you provide me with relief from this suffering that I'm going through? And we know this is what he's saying because of this word for comfort. When we think of comfort, it's the idea of relief from something. In our current situation that we're dealing with in the world, a lot of us are looking for comfort, some kind of relief from the situation we're dealing with. And so the psalmist is asking God, when will you comfort me? When will you send that comfort my way? Is what he's asking. So <clears throat> this brings us to verse 83. Now as we come into verse 83, we see that the psalmist uses this image of a wineskin in the smoke. And he says here that even though he's feeling the way he's feeling, not the, uh, the feeling described in verse 82, he says here, he will not forget what the text calls God's statutes. Now, of course, as we come to this verse, the first thing we need to understand here is what this image of a wineskin in the smoke is all about. Now, this image of a wineskin in the smoke, it's an image that, refers to a literal wineskin that has become useless because of repeated exposure to smoke from a fire burning in a household, for instance. Now this happens, now how this wineskin reaches this condition is because at this time, wineskins were usually hung from the ceiling. And as a result, they would sometimes get smoke damage from something burning because it, which caused it to become shriveled up and ultimately useless. And so by using this image, the psalmist is picturing himself as having become useless or worthless. In other words, he sees no good in his life. But even though that's the case, he says he will continue to remember what he calls God's statutes. That word statutes, it's a word that refers to rules, and regulations, which in this case are, refer, are found in God's word. And so putting all that together, what the psalmist says here in verse 83 means that in spite of these feelings that he has, these negative feelings that he's experiencing, he will continue to remember God's word and by extension put it into practice in his life. That's the idea there behind verse 83 and so the application as i said to us is we're going to have these negative feelings that when we're facing those times of difficulty when we're facing those times of suffering but in those on those occasions we still have the choice are we going to do as the psalmist did remember god's word remember god's statutes or are we going to let those feelings lead us away from god 
course, the choice we need to make is even in spite of our feelings, let them draw us nearer to God and not further away from God when we are dealing with these kinds of situations. This brings us to, you know, or not to the next point just yet, but when we put verses 81 through 83 together and apply this to the things we crave from God when we suffer, the principle here is that our craving for God's promises is intensified when we suffer. Now for the faithful servant of God, when we go through times of suffering, this tends to create in us an intense longing for God's promises to be fulfilled in our lives. Also, times of suffering can also cause us to be like the psalmist. Is God even working in these circumstances? It's okay to have those thoughts, but again, let those thoughts, let those feelings draw you closer to God and not further away. Because the fact is, as I think all of us here would agree, we are not always able to see God working in these kinds of circumstances. But that doesn't mean that he's not working because he is. And so at times like these, we like the psalmist have to take time to remember God's promises and keep doing his word even when it is difficult to do so. So this brings us to the second point that we're going to look at in verses 84 through 87. The second uh, pr principal point, um, whatever you want to call it. But the principle we'll look at from verses 84 through 87 is that our craving for God's judgment is intensified when we suffer. So this point opens here in verse 84. I'll just read it again. He asks, how many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? So this brings me to question number three I want to throw at you. The question is, publishing it now, um, especially for those of you who aren't able to see the polls. But the question is, what is the psalmist asking God in verse 84? Option A, how much longer will he have to suffer? Option B, when will God act in his situation? Again, two minutes and uh, take your time. Again, two minutes isn't hard and fast, just a general time frame. But again, the question is, what is the psalmist asking God in verse 84? The options, how much longer will he have to suffer? Or when will God act in his situation? Take your time. One more minute. Ten more seconds, and we'll close the poll. 
Again, what is the psalmist asking God in verse 84? All right. Close in the poll. And the response that I got was, when will God act in his situation? So, again, the questions he asked God here are, how many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? So we have two questions here. Now, so the first question that the psalmist asked in verse 84 is a question that asks God, how much longer is God going to have him endure his suffering? And that's what the first answer to this question, or the first option to the question I asked, lended towards, if I'm using the correct word. And so building upon that, in the second question, he's asking God, God, how long are you going to, ex or how long is it going to be before you execute judgment on those who persecute me? Now what he's asking there is how long is God going to allow his enemies to cause him to suffer? And so seeing these two questions side by side, another question we have to ask is what do these two questions have in common? What they seem to have in common is that they both have to do with the fact that the psalmist is wondering when God will bring his suffering to an end, either by taking his life, which is the how many are the days of your servant, or by carrying out judgment against his enemies. That's what the two questions have in common is when is God going to act in this situation? Either again by taking the psalmist's life and taking him to eternity, or by carrying out judgment against his enemies. And so this brings us to verse 85. In verse 85, the psalmist says to God that arrogant men or arrogant people have dug pits for him, and he describes these individuals as men who are not in accord with God's law. So here we see another picture, this idea of digging pits. Now the, this idea of the, psalmist having, of the psalmist's enemies having dug pits, it comes from a word that refers to the fact that his enemies are attempting to trap him. Sometimes when you dig a pit in this kind of situation, it's for the purpose of trapping something. And we know this is the idea here because the image of digging pits is an image that refers to the, dig to the digging of pits for the purpose of trapping animals. But the reason these arrogant people are doing this to the psalmist is because of this fact that he brings out. They are not in accord with God's law, meaning that they're living in disobedience to God's word. And this is what makes them arrogant. When we think of someone who's arrogant, this is someone who thinks they're better than everybody else for whatever reason. Now, as that applies here, these people think, I'm too good for God. I'm too good for God's word. I don't need to listen to it. And so not only do they take that attitude, but they also seek to harm those who do not have that attitude, who realize, to harm those who realize that they need to live in obedience to God's word. And so that's what these arrogant people are doing to the psalmist. The psalmist is looking to be faithful to God's word, but he's suffering persecution for it. In the same way that we read about in the New Testament instances of persecution. But another question that I think we have to ask of this text is, how does arrogance cause disobedience to God's word? And one way arrogance causes that is because arrogance, by definition, is a prideful attitude that leads people to think they know better. And in this case, leads people to think they know better than God's word. And so because they have that attitude, these people will cause difficulty for those of us who are seeking to obey God's word in our lives. And so coming into verse 86, the psalmist, even in spite of all these things, he offers a word of praise to God for the faithfulness of his commandments. But what we also see in verse 86 is a plea for help 
because the psalmist's enemies have persecuted him with a lie. Now, in the first line, again, it reads, All your commandments are faithful. Now, this is where I want to throw another question at you quickly. I'm typing it out, and then I'll publish it for you. The question is, what does it mean that God's commandments are faithful? Options are, they can be trusted, or option B, they are true. And I'm publishing that now. Again, the question, what does it mean that God's commandments are faithful? Option A, they can be trusted. Option B, they are true. So take your time with that one. about 10 more seconds. All right. And the answer that was chosen for that question was that they can be trusted. And that's definitely part of the idea of it. And the reason they can be trusted is because they are true. And so that's what is involved with this idea of their commandments being faithful. God's word, God's commandments can be trusted because they are true and they function for our benefit is an extension of all that. And so since God's commandments can be depended upon, the psalmist pleads with God that God might help him through this persecution that the text says is a result of a lie. Now, the idea of this psalm is being persecuted with a lie. This tells us that this persecution is coming in the form of false things that are being said about the psalmist. And so he needs help from God, assistance, we might say. Now, as this builds on the first line, this help from God would come from God's commandments. We've seen before, if you've been in these studies, we've seen before that the help that the psalmist needs, he realizes this is going to come from God's word because God's word helps us to know how to properly deal with our enemies. And so he says that God's commandments can be trusted and that, and that includes the fact that they can be trusted in helping us to know how to be deal, how to deal with our enemies. Uh, Andrew, I see your comment here. You said, I've always worried about sounding ungrateful in my prayers when I've had difficult situations or people in my life. And you say, I've noticed in Psalms how often they ask for enemies to be punished. I've worried that I would be disobeying. Love your enemies if I ask for punishment. On anyone that has been doing wrong. That concern is valid. And that's I'm trying to form my thought here. It's a valid concern, and that's one reason we can go to the Psalms, because the Psalms are included in God's Word for a reason, and a lot of what the Psalms do for us is they validate, is 
for the lack of a better term, they validate these feelings that we often have when we're facing difficult situations. But at the end of the day, like the psalmist, we have to go back to God's word, is help, ask God to help us lean on his word in spite of these feelings and put any situation we're facing in God's hands so that he can deal with it in his timing as we do what he wants us to do. And so I don't know if that addresses your comment appropriately, Andrea, but um, my original point, as I said, is just that the Psalms really validate some of these feelings that we have when we're faced with any given situation, whether it's suffering or enemies or any other kind of situation, because we're hardwired to have these feelings. But the question becomes, what do we do with them? Do we let them draw us closer to God or draw us further away from God, as I stated earlier? So uh, that's a good point that you made there, Andrea, with your comments, and much appreciated. But it's these things that bring us into verse 87. In verse 87, the psalmist says that his enemies have almost destroyed him on earth. But he, but he says that even in that circumstance, he did not forsake God's precepts. Now what the psalmist says here has the idea is that his enemies nearly completely destroyed him. Almost succeeded in completely destroying him, we might say. But even in that case, this did not prevent the psalmist from turning away from God's precepts. And we know this is what he's saying because of this idea of forsake. When you forsake something, you abandon it. You turn your back on it. We might also go so far as to say that the reason he was not completely destroyed is because he did lean on God's word. And so it was that leaning on God's word that spared him from any further harm that he might have suffered at the hand of his enemies. And so when we put verses 84 through 87 together and apply it to what we crave when we suffer, is that our craving for God's judgment is intensified when we suffer. Everything that the psalmist has said in verses 84 through 87 hinges upon that question, those questions of verse 84 that we talked about. And so by saying what he says in verses 85 through 87, he's giving reasons as to why he longs so much that God might relieve him of the suffering. He's going through all these difficult things, and so this is naturally creating within him these feelings. God, bring it to an end. The language of some of these words suggests he's nearly lost his life as a result of all this. And so he wants God to bring it to an end. But what we also see in these verses is that even though God is not immediately relieving him of his distress, the psalmist continues to remain faithful to God and his word until that time that God will carry out that judgment against his enemies. And that's our responsibility in this, is to remain faithful to God even in the most difficult of circumstances. And this brings us to principle number three in verse 88. Again, the point being here that our craving for God's love is intensified when we suffer. Now we see there in verse 88, he says, Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Now, <clears throat> in the first line there, we see this idea of revival. That comes according to God's loving kindness. Now, this idea of revival, uh, it's another theme that we find in Psalm 119. This isn't the first time he asked for this revival, and it's not going to be the last. I was just working in another section, a few sections ahead of this one today, and this idea comes back. This idea of revive me. 
And so what the psalmist is asking of God here is a sort of spiritual revival. But the spiritual revival is going to come from what the text calls God's loving kindness that is demonstrated towards God's faithful servants. Now this term loving kindness, we we see it several times throughout the Psalm 119. And as with other instances, this term loving kindness, it refers to the loyal and comforting love that God has toward his children. And so the psalmist, knowing that God has this loving kindness, this loyal, comforting love toward his followers, he asks God, revive me. And he knows this revival is going to come because God is this God of loving kindness. In the New Testament, we read God is love. And because God is love, because he does have this loving kindness, he gives us that new life we need to stay strong and remain faithful in the face of suffering. But the question becomes, how do, why does God's love bring spiritual revival? And the answer to that question is, be, is the reason that brings spiritual revival is because God's love is a reminder that God will reward us if we remain faithful to him in, even in times of suffering. And what that does is that it gives us the courage and the endurance to press on even in the face of difficult circumstances. That's just line number one there on verse 88. Coming into the second line of this verse, the psalmist says that the reason he wishes to experience a spiritual revival is so that he can keep the testimony of God's mouth. Now, what the psalmist says here has the sense that the reason he wishes to experience this revival is because he wants to continue to live in obedience to what the text calls the testimony of of your mouth, of God's mouth. Now, this idea, this phrase, the testimony of your mouth, is another description of God's word that we find in Psalm 119. And it more specifically has to do with the things that God has sworn to do through his word. And we know that because this word testimony, similar to how we use it today, it's a legal term that refers to a statement that is made under oath, such as in a court of law. A sworn statement, more specifically. Now, as it applies here, it might refer to the promises to the sworn statements of God that we find in his word. So the psalmist is craving God's love as it is evidenced in the things, the testimonies that God gives through his word. And so putting those two lines of verse 88 together, the principle we should see here is that our craving for God's love is intensified when we suffer. Now, in addition to what we've already discussed, suffering can intensify our craving for God's love. Ultimately, it's God's love that spiritually revives us. It's God's love that gives us the courage to go on in the face of difficult circumstances. And so it's when we suffer that above all else, we need to remember that great love that God has for us, that great love that was ultimately demonstrated through God sending Jesus to die on the cross, to suffer on our behalf. If we look to that, look to the cross, look to Jesus, and how Jesus remained faithful through his suffering, we can have that spiritual revival that the psalmist is asking for because it gives us the motivation to press on and continue to obey our God, even in the face of difficulty. So in conclusion, when we consider all that the psalmist has written here in verses 81 through 88 in this psalm, the point, the takeaway, as one of my friends called it once, is that in times of suffering, those times create within us a craving for God. 
Suffering creates in us a craving for God's promises. It creates in us a craving for God's judgment. And it creates in us a craving for God's love. Now with this being the case, the lesson we should learn is that in times of suffering, we should turn to God. Today, when people suffer, they turn to all sorts of things. But those things only offer temporary solutions. But when you turn to God, that offers an eternal solution. Because as I said at the beginning, turning to God offers to us a new perspective on our suffering. Turning to God reminds us that our suffering is not all there is. And why is that? Because it reminds us that there's coming a time when God will judge those who are causing us to suffer. It gives us new perspective because we were reminded that there is a loving God who gives us the hope that there is coming a day when our suffering will end. And as a result of those things, we can know that we can find comfort in times of suffering so long as we continue to remain faithful to God and his word. Now those are just a few things that we can learn from what the psalmist has said here in Psalm 119. I do pray this has been beneficial for you. Um, and as usual, if you have any other questions or comments, shoot me a message. Um, Drop it in the comments even after this broadcast is over. Um, I would love to talk about it more with you um, if you so desire. But uh, as we always do, before I let you guys go, uh, let's close with prayer and then uh, we'll log off. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for again for this evening that you've given to us to study your word. Father, we thank you for the words of the psalmist here who expressed to you these feelings that he was having in the face of his suffering. And we thank you that we have this example of how even in the face of his suffering, he drew nearer to you. Help us to imitate that example so that even in spite of the negative feelings that we might have toward our suffering, that we might draw near to you, knowing that you will draw near to us. And uh, most importantly, Father, help us to look to the example of Jesus and how he remained faithful, even faithful to you, even through his suffering, even his suffering on the cross. Thank you for his example and help us to follow in his example. Most of all, and forgive us when we fall short. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, thanks again, guys, for being with me. Um, Andrea, just... Saw your other comment. Uh, that's cool that you watched The Passion of the Christ. Um, definitely a great reminder of what Jesus went through for us, his suffering, among other things. Definitely humbling. Um, but again, uh, thank you for being here with me, everybody. Um, you know, Andrea, Shannon, Dina, uh, you guys were all here, and Michelle. Uh, thanks for being here with me, but I know there are others out there that I'm sure are watching uh, that I didn't know you were here, but you were here nonetheless. Uh, the good Lord knows you are here, and that's what's most important. So I hope you guys have an excellent rest of your evening. Again, I appreciate you being with me at this late hour. Um, so it means a lot. Um, and just encouraging i should say is the word that i like to use but you guys be safe stay healthy and again if you want to talk any more about this text uh, or any other text of the bible shoot me a message and um i would love to chat with you um we'll be back again wednesday night eight o'clock mountain time as we are and uh, we'll be looking at the Gospel of John, another theme uh, from that Gospel. So I hope you'll join me then as you have tonight. Uh, again, that's Wednesday night, 8 o'clock uh, Mountain Time, for those of you who are not in the Mountain Time Zone. So anyway, God bless.
Love you guys and catch you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.